Please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. Welcome to episode 57 of It's Murder Up North. For my podcast of the week, I am delighted to introduce you to a brand new podcast from Robin Warder, the host of The Trail Went Cold. He has teamed up with Jules, the host of Riddle Me That, and Professor Ashley Wellman to create The Path Went Chilly. Here is a sneak peek. Hi, I'm Robin Warder from The Trail Went Cold. If you are unfamiliar with my other podcast, I often cover stories from the television show Unsolved Mysteries. For the past five years, you've heard me talk about these cases on my own, but now's your chance to hear me have in-depth discussions about them with other people. I want to welcome you to my new project, The Path Went Chilly, where I will be discussing in depth with my two good friends and co-hosts cases that I've covered on The Trail Went Cold. Meet my co-hosts. First one up is Jules. Hi, I'm Jules from the podcast Riddle Me That True Crime, and I have a PhD in transpersonal counseling. I'm not a psychologist or a diagnostician, so don't get too excited. But I can't wait to analyze these cases with these two amazing humans. You've already met Robin. Now meet Dr. Ashley Wellman. Hi, I'm Ashley. I have a PhD in criminology, law, and society, and I specialize in trauma victims and survivors. I've spent a great deal of time working with families left behind after homicides with a cold case unit based out of Florida, and I'm also a professor of criminology. I'm so excited to be chatting with two of my best friends about the cases that everyone can't seem to get enough of. We hope in doing so that we will have a clearer perspective of what may have transpired. Oftentimes, Ashley will be totally in the dark. Jules and I will be telling Ashley a story she may not know much about, so all of her reactions are genuine. We will be releasing on all major platforms April 8th. We hope you will join us as we attempt to heat up some ice cold cases. The Path Went Chili will be available every Thursday on all major podcast platforms. Now, let's head to the episode. The morning of Monday the 18th of January 1999 was a crisp and cold winter's day in the spa town of Harrogate. A brisk wind blew and the green grass was tipped with frost. Children made their way to school, wrapped up in warm winter coats, with gloves on their hands and hats on their heads. They walked briskly into the school, eager to get out of the cold. Pupils filed into their classrooms and the chatter of many voices was swiftly silenced by the teacher as they ordered the students into their seats. Reading through the list of names, the teacher checked off each one, either as present or absent, and that would be the mark that would go beside the name of Ashley Murray, whose seat was empty. Because the school had not received any notification that the 13-year-old would be absent, the receptionist placed a call to Ashley's mother, Joanne who was completely unaware that her son had not made it to school. As soon as she hung up the phone, Joanne was making calls to all of Ashley's friend's parents, in particular the one he was supposed to be staying with the previous night. When she was informed that Ashley had not stayed there that Sunday night, nor had his friend's parents seen the 13-year-old, this only added to Joanne's concern. These calls were followed by ones to the hospitals in the area, but no one matching Ashley's description of being admitted. Exhausting all options and not knowing how long her son had been missing, Joanne placed a call to the police. The search for Ashley would prove to be difficult, as police first needed to know where and when he was last seen. Conversations with his family allowed them to determine places the teenager tended to frequent, and people he was associated with. After compiling this information, they then had the task of tracking down his friends in an attempt to know whether Ashley had gone missing of his own accord, or was it something more sinister. As the hours passed, hope still lingered that the teenager may simply be playing truant from school, and had lied to his mother about where he was going to be that night. But as darkness descended, and Monday faded into Tuesday, there was still no sign of Ashley. That night the temperature had plummeted below freezing, and as the sun rose, the chill lingered throughout the morning, with a ground frost clinging to the shadows where the sun's rays had not yet reached. 
approximately a mile to the southwest of the town centre, is a wooded area known as Burke Crag, a steep rocky formation set primarily amongst deciduous trees, with a stream flowing through the bottom of the valley. At its highest point, the crag offers spectacular views to the north. During the warmer months, the crag offers a picturesque place to walk, with sunlight piercing through the thick canopy. But in the winter, the trees are bare, the ground damp, and it can feel like a desolate place to be. At midday, an elderly man was walking with his dog along one of the many woodland trails. When the dog descended the steep crag and began sniffing at something on the ground, harshly concealed in brambles. Edging closer, the man could make out that it appeared to be a black bin bag. Initially, the man called the dog away, believing it was some discarded rubbish. But as the dog lingered, the man tried to get a closer look. He managed to clamber a bit closer, but the ground was too steep for him to proceed further. Yet from his new vantage point, he was able to see that it wasn't rubbish. It was a boy, lying face down on the ground. Unable to get any closer, the man called his dog away and headed home to contact the police. Recovery efforts were hampered by the nature of the terrain. Emergency vehicles were unable to get close to the site. Assistant Divisional Officer Tim Ralph of North Yorkshire Fire Brigade described the difficulties they encountered and what they found when they reached the bottom. Quote, it is steep, broken ground. He was lying on flat ground at the bottom next to a stream. We believe he had been there since Sunday evening. He was conscious. He was able to communicate, but he was in a very, very poor state of health, suffering from hypothermia and other injuries, and it was obvious that he needed to be at the hospital immediately. Rescuers made the climb down the 400 metre crag to reach Ashley, and as he was transported from the spot where he lay, first responders spoke to him in an effort to keep the teenager conscious asking him about his favourite football team and anything else to keep him calm and awake. Ashley was taken to Harrogate Hospital and was soon joined by his parents. After his condition was assessed, he was found to have a collapsed lung and fractured ribs, which were injuries consistent with a fall. And due to the 13-year-old being exposed to freezing conditions, he was also suffering from hypothermia and frostbite. If these were his only injuries, it would have been easy to assume that the teenager had accidentally fallen down the crag. However, doctors also found a total of 18 stab wounds, one of which was just a millimetre away from severing a major blood vessel in his brain. It was estimated that Ashley had been lying at the bottom of the crag for roughly 36 hours, and the boy's resilience astounded both investigators and medical professionals. The teenager would spend several months in the hospital undergoing numerous surgeries, including efforts to remove bone fragments from his brain, and two years later, he would have his big toe amputated due to frostbite. Following the rescue, a press conference was held at Harrogate Police Station, during which Detective Chief Inspector Jim Allen addressed those in attendance. He stated, It is unclear how he arrived at the point where he was found. Whether he was pushed, dragged, or had fallen remains to be clarified. It took fire crews and ambulance staff an hour to rescue Ashley, who was dressed in warm clothing. I find it difficult to believe that any person, yet alone a young man of 13, in a very injured condition, could survive in the open air for such a long time. Ashley is obviously a fighter. I find it difficult to comprehend that he survived that length of time without medical attention and in such conditions. Ashley is just a regular schoolboy who doesn't seem to have had any problems with his home or school life. End quote. Ashley would later recall his ordeal during an interview with Rob Priest, a reporter at the Yorkshire Post. He told Rob about how he lay at the foot of the crag, with a stream flowing just feet away from him. Quote, I couldn't move, but I was just lying there thinking about how I was going to get out. I thought back to television programmes I had watched about how to survive in difficult conditions, and I did some of the things I remembered from them. I remember licking the rainwater off my jacket. I wet myself to keep myself warm, and I tried to keep thinking about things. I wasn't at all confident that I was going to be rescued, but I never thought that I was going to die there. 
Ashley proceeded to recollect how he was found, quote, The dog came up and started licking my face. I heard the man say he couldn't get down the slope to me, on account of his age, but he said he was going to get help. I was happy to see him, but when he said he was leaving, I was like, God, no. Despite being in a critical condition, investigators took advantage of the fact that Ashley was conscious and attempted to find out how he had ended up severely injured in that isolated spot. During his interview with the Yorkshire Post, Ashley said, I remember the police asking me who had done this to me, and I kept saying, Gilly and Fuller, but because of my injuries, it was about 15 minutes before they could make out the words. This information led police to appeal for anyone to come forward if they had seen three boys in the vicinity of Burt Crag at approximately 6.30 on Sunday evening. It was also revealed that investigators were questioning two teenage boys, and that given Ashley's injuries, the incident was being investigated as an attempted murder. The two teenage boys would not be named publicly until after the trial, when it was revealed that Ashley had been attacked by 14-year-old Robert Fuller and 13-year-old Daniel Gill. Ashley had known Daniel Gill for three years, having met at Rossett High School. They quickly became best friends. The two boys would spend a lot of time together, after school and at weekends, often staying overnight at each other's homes. So naturally the name of Daniel, as one of the attackers, was hard to come to terms with. He came from a loving household, being one of three boys raised by Jonathan and Alison. Daniel proved to be an intelligent child who had a placid demeanour, and according to teachers, he had a bright future. One former school friend recalled, quote, He was always reading books, and was very quiet. He's one of the swats. Upon starting at Rossett High School, Daniel became acquainted with Robert Fuller, and in doing so, he began to change. His behaviour took a negative turn, and with Fuller at his side, Daniel started to get into fights, and had become disruptive. Recalling their fellow pupil, one former classmate stated, He always wore this vacant look. I think his mother and father began to despair with him. He never seemed able to concentrate. Daniel's change in behaviour wasn't only causing his parents' concern, but it also put him on the police radar due to his association with Robert Fuller. But unlike the older boy, Daniel had no prior convictions. He had, however, been referred to a child psychiatrist and had apparently told friends that he was hearing voices and was suffering from hallucinations. Daniel's friend, 14-year-old Robert Fuller, had spent his early years living on various British army bases in Germany, with his younger sister, their royal engineer father Robert, and their mother, Vanessa. By the time the boy had entered his teenage years, his father had left, and Vanessa took her children and moved to Harrogate where she developed a relationship which would prove to be tumultuous. John Murthick described her grandson's upbringing, quote, Robert had a harsh childhood. His father was brutal and treated him like he was in the army. By 1999, Robert Fuller was known to the police for his volatile temperament. He also had a number of convictions. This included one in which he broke into a local pub in order to steal alcohol. On another occasion, he was charged with criminal damage, after vandalising a motor vehicle. His disruptive behaviour also affected his schooling, with Robert being suspended twice due to unacceptable conduct. Due to his aggressive tendencies and the negative impact it was having on Robert's life, the teenager was referred to a psychiatrist, with whom he discussed his epic fits, or epis as he tended to refer to them. He stated, quote, when I throw an epi, I start punching and fighting. I can't stop. It builds up inside me and I've just got to get it out. It was through Daniel Gill that Ashley became associated with Robert Fuller, although the relationship between the trio was not equal, with claims that Ashley was being used by the boys who would ask him for money to buy alcohol and cigarettes. The two teenagers were swiftly arrested and charged with attempted murder and in August 1999, Fuller and Gill appeared in court to face judgment. The pair entered a plea of not guilty, with Robert Fuller claiming that he was unaware that the attack was going to take place. 
while his co-defendant, Daniel Gill, claimed he had nothing to do with the crime, and accused a man called Paul Ahrens, who would appear as a witness during the trial of being the true culprit. The defence lawyer Roger Keane QC would further Gill's claims regarding Paul Ahrens, who at the time of the court proceedings was serving a five-year prison sentence for the possession of drugs with the intent to supply. The claim that 39-year-old Paul had befriended the boys and introduced them to a world of drugs, drink and the occult. It was also alleged by Daniel that Paul had said Ashley had to die as it was what the gods wanted. These claims were reinforced by accounts from people who lived close to Paul, who often saw Daniel and Robert at the 39-year-old's flat. Although they apparently lied to their parents regarding their whereabouts, instead claiming that they were going to youth club. One neighbour, Brian Barrett, told a reporter, quote, The boys would arrive at 8am and would leave very late at night. They were cheeky, cocky lads. Robert and Danny were the worst. Ashley was the nicest. He was very polite. Allegations that errands would supply the children with cigarettes, alcohol and drugs were also made when one friend of the teenagers stated, they would sit around drinking, and it was obvious that both Fuller and Gill were taking drugs. They would burn out bins, knock roadwork signs over, and set pieces of paper on fire. It was also revealed that Paul Ahrens had introduced the teenagers to a variety of weapons. He would often take them to a shop in Harrogate, which sold an array of blades, air rifles, and martial arts equipment. Robert and Daniel had also been witnessed carrying knives by a number of people who claimed that the boys would often display them in an attempt to impress others, and they would allegedly chase female pupils with them. These claims were reinforced by evidence recovered by police while conducting searches of the two boys' homes, during which they retrieved a number of knives. However, when Aarons appeared on the witness stand, he refuted Daniel's allegations that he was responsible for the attempted murder of Ashley but he did accept that he had created an unhealthy environment and had been a negative influence on the teenagers. The jury were then provided with an account of what happened to Ashley Murray on that cold January evening in 1999. They were advised that the teenager had been playing football on the fields near his home, when at about 7pm he accompanied Robert and Daniel to the nature reserve at Burke Crag. The three boys walked about for a little bit, until they came to a bird-watching hide, which had been locked up for the night. An attempt was made to break into the wooden hut, but when that failed, the trio headed towards the crag. Speaking to Rob Reese from the Yorkshire Post, Ashley described what happened next. Quote, we started walking down the steep crag. They told me to go first, because it was dark. One of them had a record bag, and I remember hearing it being opened. After about five minutes, they jumped on me from behind. One of them stabbed me in the cheek, and it went straight through and knocked out my teeth. I jumped up and started running away, but my shoe fell off and I fell over. They caught up with me, and it started again. They stabbed me eleven times in the head. Probably lasted about twenty minutes, but I lost all sense of time. I wasn't screaming. I was in shock, to the point where I couldn't make a sound. I remember lying on the floor shaking and hearing Gil say, Shit Fuller, he isn't dead yet. It was determined that the assailants had used a screwdriver and a knife to attack Ashley, with Gil being the one who wielded the knife and was said to have stabbed Ashley in the cheek and head multiple times. When Ashley attempted to flee, it was Robert Fuller who prevented his escape and the eldest of the three boys stabbed Ashley in the arm at least once. Lying on the wet ground severely injured and bleeding profusely, Ashley was unable to flee from his attackers, so he pretended to be dead. It was only at this point that the boys, his so-called friends, stopped their assault. Believing that Ashley was now dead, Robert and Daniel proceeded to wrap the boy in black bin bags and then they attempted to conceal the body beneath some nearby brambles, where at about half past nine at night, the teenagers abandoned him. The following morning, after learning that Ashley was missing, his mum had called round to Daniel Gill's home, as that was where she assumed he would likely be. It was there she was informed by Daniel's mother 
that according to her son, the two boys had had an argument whilst playing football, and Ashley had walked off. Daniel told his mum, who just presumed that Ashley had headed home to calm down. Eleven years after the attack, Ashley provided a rare interview, in which he stated, Gil and I were typical best friends. There was nothing in his behaviour that suggested anything was about to happen. It turned out that they had been planning it since September. One aspect of the trial that reignited a topic of conversation was the teenager's exposure to drink, drugs and explicit media content. With the human brain still developing into the mid-twenties, the effects of substance abuse has been the focus of research for years. These investigations have found that the use of narcotics and alcohol during adolescence can have a detrimental effect on the brain's development, particularly in the area that controls emotion, rational thinking and risk assessment. According to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, quote, drug use is associated with a variety of negative consequences, including increased risk of serious drug use later in life, school failure and poor judgment, which may put teens at risk for accidents, violence, unplanned and unsafe sex and suicide. It also emerged during the trial that just hours prior to the crime being committed, Robert and Daniel had been watching the horror film Scream, in which a masked killer torments and attacks his victims, and it features some graphic murder scenes. Police would also find drawings of the infamous mask featured in the film, as well as depictions of knives in the teenager's school books. This was not the first time, nor sadly the last, that the film Scream and its subsequent sequels have been connected to a violent crime. Ironically, the film itself was inspired by the murders of Daniel Rowling, a.k.a. the Gainesville Ripper, an American serial killer who brutally murdered five college students in 1990, six years before the film was released. Just two years after the film's release, and a year prior to the attack on Ashley, a murder occurred in California, during which 16-year-old Mario Padilla and his 15-year-old cousin Samuel Ramirez attacked and killed Mario's mother, Gina Castillo. CBS News reported that the teenagers had committed this murder in order to gain access to Gina's money, so they could purchase ghost-faced costumes and an electronic voice modulator. They then intended to carry out five Scream-inspired murders. For the murder of his mother, Mario Padilla was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, while his cousin, who had held Gina down while Mario stabbed her, was sentenced to a minimum term of 25 years. Speaking to CBS News, psychologist Madeleine Levine, who specialised in the impact of exposure to violence on children, stated, There were a whole bunch of reasons why they acted out that way. But did the movie provide a blueprint? Absolutely. You need a cat to copy. In this case, Scream is that cat. The next case occurred in Belgium in 2001, in which 24-year-old Thierry Gerardin had arranged for his neighbour, 15-year-old Alison Cambier, to come to his home under the pretense of giving her some cassettes. Once Alison entered his home, Thierry allegedly told her that he was in love with her, but when she replied that she didn't feel the same, he headed into the bathroom, put on a ghost face mask, and ended up stabbing Alison 30 times before mutilating her body. The Guardian newspaper reported that the killer placed a rose in his victim's hand, and then confessed to the crime by calling Alison's father. Thierry Gerardin would go on to state that the film Scream had inspired him to plan the crime. Just a year later, 15-year-old Alice Buffer was murdered by her 17-year-old neighbour in France. He had repeatedly been watching the film and decided to commit the crime to see what it was like to stab someone. During the attack, Alice was stabbed 42 times while her assailant wore the Scream mask. It was claimed by the prosecution at trial that although the film was not responsible for the crime, it provided the assailant with a blueprint for murder. The Times newspaper reported that the defence stated, quote, We cannot neglect the fact that Scream played on the defendant's personality. In the final months preceding these events, 
he retired into a virtual world. His parents did not realise it. You cannot hide his considerable existential unhappiness. His parents did not understand him. He was miserable and he was withdrawn. The defendant was sentenced to 22 years in prison. One of the most infamous cases occurred in Idaho in September 2006 when Brian Lee Draper and Tory Michael Adamchik murdered Casey Jost on art. This one is probably the closest to the actual events in the film. Two 16-year-old boys targeted Casey, who attended the same high school as them. On the 22nd of September, they visited the home which she was looking after for her auntie, where they spent time with Casey and her boyfriend. While there, one of them unlocked a door to allow them to enter the house later. They then left the property, proceeded to cut the power, and in a heartbreaking twist of fate, Casey's boyfriend asked his mum if he could stay with his girlfriend because she was afraid. Tragically, his mum refused, although she did offer to let Casey come to their house, which the teenage girl refused because she had promised to stay and look after the home. Adam Chick and Draper observed Casey's boyfriend leave, and once she was alone, the two boys entered through the unlocked door and proceeded to stab the terrified teenager 29 times. Upon being apprehended by police, Adam Chick stated that he was inspired by the film Scream, and it was later claimed that the boys believed they would become famous for committing the crime. So what is it about Scream that has influenced these individuals to take another person's life? Is it because the killers in the film are relatable, given that when they are unmasked they are teenagers themselves? as opposed to characters such as Leatherface or Freddy Krueger, who although terrifying, they aren't characters you can connect with on a human level. Whereas the killers in Scream appear like normal college students, until it's revealed that they are not. I would be fascinated to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think that there is a correlation between films and computer games and adolescents committing violent crimes? Or do you think that they are being used as scapegoats? Or as a way to try and explain the inexplicable actions of the perpetrator? With regards to the two teenagers who attacked Ashley Murray, they would be found guilty of attempted murder and were sentenced in October of 1999. During his closing statements, the judge Arthur Myerson QC made reference to the influence the film, drugs and alcohol may have had on the defendants. He referred to the conclusions of psychiatrists who had worked with the two boys and had found that there was a strong correlation between their exposure to drink, drugs and violent movies and the behaviour that led up to them committing the crime, concluding that such exposure had, quote, blurred the lines between fantasy and reality and between right and wrong. Judge Myerson QC reminded the teenagers that they were not being tried as adults and if that had been the case, they would be facing a more severe sentence. He also stated that he deemed them to be, quote, a serious risk to the public. He then continued to state, From the moment you set out that morning, the death of Ashley Murray was on your minds. When the two of you believed he was dead, you tried to put his body in bin liners. He proceeded to sentence the two teenagers to a total of six years each and upon this ruling he also allowed for the ban on naming the defendants to be lifted, with the reasoning that due to the severity of the crime, it was in the public interest for them to be named. As Fuller and Gill were transported away from the court to start their sentences, Ashley's parents released a statement which read, No words can describe the anger and disgust that we feel, not only for the two boys responsible, also, the evil influence by others. Less than four years after they were sentenced, both teenagers had been released from prison on parole. During the interview with Yorkshire Post reporter Rob Priest, Ashley reflected on the fact his attackers were free, quote, In their minds, when they left me there, I was dead, and it should have been treated as such. But one of them served three years, and the other served three and a half. That was the hardest part for me. He would tell Rachel Shields from The Independent, quote, When they got out of prison, I stopped going out for about a year. From the way Fuller acted, 
I don't think that he has changed at all. He was very aggressive. I wasn't the one that did anything wrong, yet I was made to feel like I couldn't go out. It emerged in 2004 that while a pupil at Rossett High School, Robert Fuller was one of ten children selected for a Home Office school behaviour project, which was conducted with the assistance of York University. During the project, five support workers were assigned to seven schools in North Yorkshire, where they were to work with individuals who were at high risk of expulsion from school due to behavioural issues. The project was run over four years and was ultimately deemed to be successful. The aim of the project was to see if the intervention of a support worker could help improve the pupils' behaviour and keep them within education. Robert was entered into the programme two years prior to the attack and was reported as being a disruptive child who was known to the police. Despite him receiving additional support from the caseworker, Robert's behaviour failed to improve. During the course of the project, Robert was suspended from school following an incident a year prior to the attack on Ashley, in which Fuller, along with a group of friends, assaulted a ten-year-old boy who had autism. They taunted the child and put gravel inside his clothing. Later that same year, after being allowed back to school, Robert was suspended again. This time he was alleged to have been bullying another pupil. Yet, when this suspension was lifted, there seemed to be an improvement in Robert's behaviour, and by the end of 1998 it was decided that he no longer required a support worker, and just a matter of weeks later, in January 1999, Robert, accompanied by Daniel Gill, would attack Ashley Murray and leave him for dead. The subsequent report published by the University and Home Office stated, quote, whether continued support worker involvement might have contributed to avert the situation Robert is in is an unanswerable question. In this and other similar projects, staff turnover and the end of project funding can withdraw support from vulnerable youngsters and their families at times when they may be most in need of it. This report resulted in the introduction of support workers in schools to help reduce the number of pupils who are permanently excluded from school and provide additional support to teaching staff by giving one-on-one -on -one attention to the individual and reducing potential disruption in lessons. It was found, however, that the intervention of support workers in the school setting did not translate to a reduction in the pupils' quote, offending behaviour. In the months and years following the attack, Ashley Murray had to undergo numerous operations and he still had to contend with partial paralysis. He also had to face the mental scars left by the attack, with him struggling to build relationships due to his inability to trust people. He suffered from panic attacks, flashbacks and nightmares, with him becoming anxious if he is near somebody using a knife. During his interview with Rob Priest, Ashley recalled how the attack had affected his life. Quote, I missed a lot of school. And when I went back, I went there from hospital for two days a week, with a nurse by my side, because of the trust issues. Because I had missed so much schooling, and because it was supposedly my best friend, and a friend of his, who had done this, going back to that school was hard. It taught me quite a big lesson. When I went back to school, I appreciated it a bit more. I definitely missed the sports side of things, which I could not get involved in, and I appreciated the other things about school. The mistake I made was getting involved with the wrong crowd at an age when I would not really have known any different. Despite missing a substantial amount of school, Ashley still achieved his GCSEs and went on to acquire a qualification in IT, which allowed him to get a career in IT sales. He refused to let his physical limitations hold him back and focused on the future. He told Rob Priest, quote, I don't really think about my injuries now, and I wouldn't want to. I live alone now, even though the doctors told me I would never walk again, and I have a girlfriend. I go out with friends, and I do all the normal things that people my age do. I remember what life was like before the attack, but you have to get on with it, and accept it, say, that's life, and have a good time. 
So I would love to tell you that Ashley moved on and he is living a good life, but sadly I cannot, as on Saturday the 14th of July 2012, he was involved in a road traffic collision, in which he was pronounced dead at the scene. He was just 27 years old. A subsequent inquest would reveal that Ashley had spent that Saturday afternoon drinking. It was alleged that he had consumed approximately 10 pints of lager. He then got in his car and headed to a friend's party, where he continued to drink, followed by a trip to a bar in Harrogate. Not long before 11pm, he was once again climbing into his silver Porsche Boxster and made his way towards Leeds. While driving along the A61, he attempted to overtake Karen Browning, who was in her Citroën Picasso. The hearing heard that at the point Ashley had begun the overtake, there were clear markings on the road to demonstrate that overtaking was prohibited and dangerous due to a blind bend ahead. However, Ashley committed to the manoeuvre, narrowly missing hitting Karen's car. He clipped the curb, causing him to lose control of the vehicle. It went into a spin, mounted the verge where the driver's side of the car collided with a tree, which then flipped the car onto its roof. The crash caused extensive head injuries, which proved to be fatal. Ashley Murray was determined to be two and a half times over the drink drive limit, and the coroner, Rob Turnbull, ruled his death was accidental, concluding, quote, I can only put it down to the fact his ability to drive a fast vehicle was impaired. Tributes to Ashley came in from the head teacher of Rossett High School, who stated, A terrible thing happened to him whilst he was a pupil here. Everybody remembers him, as he came back from that, really determined, really resilient. He was really determined to succeed in life. And that makes it all the more tragic that this has happened. There were also tributes from CCI Distribution, where he had been employed for three years. A spokesman from the company stated, Ash was a very special person who had somehow survived a horrendous experience in his early teens. and was building a great career at CCI. Not only was he a major asset to the company, more importantly, he was a fine young man with very high standards of personal integrity who consistently went out of his way to help others. Thank you for joining me for episode 57. Episode 58 will be available next week. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 